Hi folks, my name is Adam B. Levine. I'm the founder of Let's Talk Bitcoin and the CEO of Tokenly Incorporated. Three years ago, I started the Let's Talk Bitcoin show with the intent to broaden the conversation from the current and future price of the Bitcoin token to the much more interesting topic of what had or was becoming possible now that the primordial fire of cryptocurrency had been lit and was beginning to burn on its own. From early on, the value proposition presented to us as the future of Bitcoin was one of smoother, less expensive cross-border transactions, and a new level of financial privacy. Ironically, even though we find ourselves in a world that seems perfectly suited to making those things important, the vast majority of people really don't care. (laughs) In the winter of 2013, I came upon the idea to use a cryptocurrency as a rewards program, where instead of using your computer to computationally mine, your actions in the community would be tracked, and you'd be awarded proportionally, based on your contribution during the past week. When people are first getting interested in Bitcoin, the can I mine conversation always comes up. And for the first few years of Bitcoin, the answer was yes, install Bitcoin on your computer and earn some Bitcoins by helping the network. But there's a flaw. The Bitcoin mining reward can only ever be won by a single miner. It doesn't matter if there are four active miners or 100,000. Each block, it's a race between miners, where the first place winner gets the prize, and everybody else has to try again to be the lucky one. In contrast, the proof of participation metric, along with a few others, gave us the ability to do what Bitcoin mining never could, and each week award literally everyone participating. LTB Coin showed me that with the tools available, we could now create a token that shared almost all of the beneficial aspects of Bitcoin. Yet, it could be branded specifically to a company or project, created as needed at basically no cost, and even used in the same wallet as Bitcoin and almost any other token built on it. The problem with LTB Coin also became clear. When you give away a token for free, it's very hard to then turn around and offer something valuable in exchange. And lacking a valuable token, what's the point of having it? On today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're going to talk about exactly this. How I, along with the rest of the team at Tokenly, are tailoring and pushing tokens into new markets that have real value and new users where cryptocurrency really solves problems outside the realm of money. First, I'd like to share with you the basics of Tokenly for crowdfunding. Then we'll be joined by Stephanie for a conversation about Minimum Viable Data, or MVD, and the prototype Tokenly Music Project. Later, we'll check in with Devin and Nick, my two technical co-founders, about Ethereum and APIs. And then finally, we'll rejoin Stephanie to talk about the two biggest problems in the way of any mainstream cryptocurrency use and how we've solved them. So here's a quick overview of what we're doing with crowdfunding and why it makes sense. Tokenly creates modular tools that let people do all the things they'd want or need to do to use a token in their business. Tokens are useful as unfakeable gift certificates, swappable passwords, transferable rights, really anything you could want to represent digital ownership. Beyond what the token itself does, businesses need to be able to issue, customize, distribute and mask, buy and sell, accept as payment, and even more for their token to work properly in such a system. For the last two years, we've been focused on building out those exact tools, and late last year we finished that foundational step. Since then, the challenge has shifted. With the work we've done, we can go after any of a dozen attractive market opportunities, but the one that we've settled on is rewards-based crowdfunding. Rewards-based crowdfunding is the Kickstarter style of threshold-based crowdfunding. Bob has a great hat design, but doesn't have the money for his first production run. In the old days, he'd get a small business loan or sell part of his company. Rewards-based crowdfunding gives Bob the option to present his hat design directly to his future customers. Each potential customer can then become a project backer or supporter of the project by pledging money in exchange for rewards that will be produced once the campaign is successful. A campaign is considered successful once backer pledges exceed the amount needed for the project to go forward. And if not enough pledges are received, the project fails and the backers never pay anything. Tokenly connects successful crowdfunding campaigns in cryptocurrency. If a campaign fails, it never touches tokens. It's only after successfully raising their stated goal that they gain the mandate to spend the money on their project, and it's at that point that tokens become actually useful. In the old style of rewards-based crowdfunding, a successful project thanks its backers and writes their names down on a glorified list of what they owe to whom. Rewards can't be transferred because the campaign doesn't want to spend the time or risk messing with the list. And the crowdfunding platforms also don't want the responsibility because it puts more burden on their site security. With Tokenly, instead of a promise, backers receive their rewards as a campaign-branded token, that is, first an access token, connecting the current backer with the campaign for news, updates, and exclusive access, and which, once the product is ready, 
can be redeemed at the campaign's website for whatever reward or perk it represents. Tokens are, of course, transferable. That's basically their primary attribute. In the old style, if a backer hits hard times and needs a refund, there's no answer for them beyond sorry. If someone who would have backed the project finds out about it days or weeks after the campaign has ended, they're generally out of luck. And if a business or individual wants to become a reseller or redistributor of the product, it involves contracts, lawyers, time, and money. With tokens, a backer who needs a refund doesn't need to beg the campaign. Anybody interested can buy it from them, solving their problem without hurting the viability of the overall project. Someone who finds out about the project after the campaign has succeeded now has two options. They can buy it from someone who already owns it, or even buy it directly from the campaign itself. Most of the time, crowdfunding campaigns offer discounts to users who support during that crucial pre-success period, but those discounts go away when the campaign ends. Now that rewards are transferable in token form, you can have customers banding together to do group buys, digital co-op type arrangements, or even start businesses that take the wholesale retail model online, buying marketable rewards in bulk, and then reselling the token or redeeming it on behalf of their own customers, profiting from products they never take possession of and which are delivered directly from the campaign to the reseller's customer. The fact that you or anyone else can now operate a business with a very limited real-world footprint, connecting customers with crowdfunded products, means that rewards-based crowdfunding as a whole now has an entirely new demographic of funders and evangelists who can be motivated at least in part by something entirely new, a profit motive. Our go-to-market strategy is unique. Rather than trying to create our own successful crowdfunding platform empowered by our solutions, we'll partner with existing, already successful platforms, providing our solutions and tools as co-branded merchant services offered to their customers and generating revenue for the crowdfunding platform long after their campaigns have ended. Each platform we partner with becomes a steady source of new, valuable tokens that are issued by real companies already validated by their first customers. Once a product is represented as a token, there's no reason to stop and plenty of reasons to continue. So as time goes on, we'll see the number of real, valuable tokens, supported by successful companies that have nothing to do with cryptocurrency, form what we think of as a global distributed barter network enabling digital product-to-product -product trades between businesses not involving money at all. And finally, all of this means it's possible to connect crowdfunding platforms in a new way. When someone lists a project on Kickstarter, they don't list it on Indiegogo or any of the other thousand crowdfunding communities out there. Tokenly's partner platforms can choose to offer and relist campaigns found elsewhere in our customer network, which means more eyeballs and money for good campaigns, the ability for the originating platform to earn fees paid by backers outside their community, and the ability for a referring platform to earn fees from good projects that didn't pick them as their platform of choice. So those are the basics. This is the best opportunity we see, with the most to gain, the shortest path to success, the biggest potential to actually change the world, and all the pieces in place to push, pretty much now. On April 12th, we're launching an equity crowd sale open to qualified investors for Tokenly Incorporated at banktothefuture.com. Visit banktothefuture.com on April 12th to learn more. With the basic explanation out of the way, let's turn our attention to one of the most interesting technological movements that is, despite its importance, still virtually unheard of outside of certain parts of the music industry. The idea is minimum viable data. For this conversation, I'm joined by Stephanie Murphy. You ever heard of a company called uh, Reed Digi? No. Yeah, I hadn't either. Um, apparently, they were in business until about 2014, and they were just around for a couple of years. They were a company that allowed you to resell the music that you had purchased uh, on iTunes or other services. And uh, it was a it was a well funded company. Had um, you know academic uh, co founders who had uh, come up with some you know new technology. And their basic argument and the way their technology worked was um, you would download their client, and then it would connect essentially with your music library and all of these other things. And you could list things based on what you owned and it could see what you owned. And then once you owned something, right, once you had listed something, if someone purchased it, then at the exact moment that they paid for it, it would be deleted from your computer 
and replaced and uh, and given to this new person. And they could they had a way that they could do this provably and show that it was never in two places at, at the same time and that nobody retained copies and stuff like that. No double spending. Right. Your and MP3s. so <laughs> the problem with this was that they got sued quite heavily and it went quite high in the legal system and the eventual ruling that came down was that uh, it was the copying that was the problem. It didn't matter that they, they essentially reinstated, they said that first sale doctrine works here, right? If you buy something, you own it and you have the right to resell it. What you don't have the right to do when it comes to digital files is make a copy of it. And so if you think about that, that's a ridiculous standard because if you yeah. have, you know, a file in one folder on your computer and you drag it and drop it into another folder on your computer, you've just created, you know, you've just copied and then deleted that, that file. And so uh, under this ruling, you can't even legally do that with your MP3s. The only way that you could legally sell your MP3s or other music files that you've legally purchased is if you pull the hard drive that it actually exists on and you sell someone that, then that then essentially oh, that seriously? <laughs> that, that was li uh, literally the, wow. the outcome of that case. And so that company went out of business. And so the interesting part here is that that is not the case with tokens. With tokens, when you send something to someone, it just doesn't fundamentally have that problem. And so this led... Right, because there's no making a copy of it. There's it's no making a copy. It's, it's not even moving it. It's reassigning ownership. So right. if you think about what you're, what, what you're trying to do in a best case scenario with you know, selling music, digital music from someone to someone else, you are selling a license. You are transferring a license. And so it's the perfect type of mechanism for exactly that type of thing. So there's a concept in uh, the music industry right now, a conversation that's been going on for about maybe six to nine months um, called minimum viable data or MVD. And the okay, idea, what is that? Never heard of that. Yeah, I had never heard of it either before I started really looking into this heavily. Um, it, you're going to be hearing about it soon, though. Uh, it's going to be it's, it's ha totally happening. It's going to become a fact of life. Minimum viable data for music basically recognizes that there's a big problem right now with rights management in music. You know, if I upload a song that I don't own to YouTube, YouTube doesn't know that I don't own it. And furthermore, they have no idea who does own it. And there's really not very many good ways to tell. Recently, uh, we've seen companies uh, that effectively try to take sound fingerprints of every song that ever exists anywhere and then compare it against anything that is ever uploaded anywhere yep. <laughs> so that you can do automated takedowns. But that's a recognition that this is a big problem. So minimum viable data essentially takes the concept and says, all right, well, what if the information about who owns the rights and who gets paid and what the terms are and all this other stuff traveled with the song file itself, traveled with the data itself? So this is, again, the minimum viable data to have a, a system that would actually work. In that type of scenario, when someone uploads a song to YouTube, YouTube can effectively just check who owns it, what the terms are under which they can monetize it, uh, what, you know, who they need to pay um, in order to do what and any other kind of conditions that are associated with it. And then they can know exactly what to do and they can put ads on it, even if it was uploaded by a person who is other than the person who actually owns the rights, because uh, YouTube can collect its part and they know who to send the other part to. That's actually really interesting because... So I'm thinking I'm a voice actor, right? And usually when I get hired, I, I'm working with a client who's maybe a video producer or something. If I'm going to narrate like an explainer video or a YouTube video, the client hires me, the video producer, they pay me once, it's a full buyout. And then, you know, any YouTube ads or whatever, the revenue goes to the person whose YouTube account that video is on and whatever. If I had some kind of data fingerprint that went with my voiceovers, I could effectively do more of like a royalty sharing model potentially with, uh, with narrations like that instead of doing a full buyout, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a ton of flexibility. And at first, this is going to be very simple. The information about who to pay isn't going to even be a Bitcoin address, I don't think. I think it's going to be like, you know, call Bob, here's his phone number, he'll give you banking information. So it's going to be really basic, but I like that because it means that, again, this is very likely to happen. It's been moving very quickly, and I've had a couple of meetings that basically suggest that you know, we're going to see results from this in the next two months or three months. So that's really exciting because if this does come out, it'll come out as a standard. And once there's a standard, then you can start to build on the standard. Different people can do different things with the standard. You can do all kinds of stuff. So anyways, I came to this because I you know, came to the minimum viable data thing because um, I've been working with Tatiana Moroz on the idea of artist coins now for over two years, amazingly enough. Oh, yes. Yeah, she was the first to do that. 
for the last couple of months, I haven't talked about this anywhere yet, so I guess this is an announcement. For the last couple of months, we've been working on a project called Tokenly Music. So Tokenly Music is a standalone application, modified version of a couple of our other tools that allows anyone to create a digital album out of a token. And so what it means is that you create an account and then you can uh, upload your songs. You can uh, put in the minimum viable data for your songs because, again, we're going to be complying with the standard and uh, associate different access tokens with it. And then there's uh, both a player and an API and there will be an Android app in a couple of weeks that allow you to log in with your Tokenly account. And then based on what album coins you have, you get uh, unlimited streaming access to the music that is associated with that. There are a couple of different use cases that are interesting, but not immediately obvious when it comes to something like this. Um, so Tokenly Music doesn't have the, uh, the listener as the customer. Tokenly Music has the artist as the customer. The artist effectively uses Tokenly Music like a, uh, a platform, right? They use it like a service provider rather than partnering. So if you like you Spotify, know, well, if you right, that's what essentially happens with something like Spotify is that Spotify takes some of the money, you get some of the money as a result, but ultimately everything goes through them and it has to be enabled by Spotify at a fundamental level where this ties back to minimum viable data and where I actually, you know, this is what I was trying to convince to get into the base um, format for it. The, the kind of base default um, is the idea that if an artist has the access tokens associated with the minimum viable data that travels with the songs, then the artist can say, you know, YouTube, as part of the monetization for this, uh, you have to respect the overriding rights of the people who have bought the album directly from me. And so YouTube can uh, monetize, you know, with ads for people who don't have the right token. But if you do have the right token, then YouTube doesn't monetize because there are overriding rights essentially there. And so the advantage for YouTube in a system like this is that using that same API or, you know, Spotify or anybody else for that matter, they can look through all of the different uh, songs and all of the different content that's available. They can see all of the deals for it and they can pull things on proactively, even if, you know, some random person hasn't posted it. So it effectively gives, uh, it creates a decentralized or at least at a, a lower layer content engine that then platforms can pull in, right? Whether they're pulling it in for monetization, pulling it in to just, you know, add content to their platform, really whatever, uh, you can do that. And so like with Spotify, for example, or Pandora is kind of a better example, um, the Pandora music service uh, doesn't allow you to pick the song that you're going to play next. It allows you to pick like the, mm -hmm. the kind of song that you're going to play right. next. Uh, and that's because of the way that they have their licensing deal. It's not because they, you know, want people to never play the song that they want. It's just because those are the terms of the license and it was how they were able to get it cheap. But again, like if you had them integrate the uh, Tokenly Music API, then now their users not only get access to the, uh, to the things provided through their subscription based on their licensing, but they also get access based on what digital albums they actually own. And from a big data point of view, just pivoting to that for a second, this means that people's record collections are now effectively pseudonymously uh, available online. And you can see when, uh, you know, somebody who owns album A sells it, you can see what the person that they sold it to, what albums they have. And yet there's no identity information associated with it. It's just kind of collection and raw data. That's new. This stuff is all new. That's really the thing about it is that finding uses for these tokens where they're good fits is a challenge because it's new technology and you know it's both about getting people to use it and also about finding places where the fit is really good so we've done this music project and i'm excited about it and incidentally anybody who um, has either tatiana coin or any of my mind to matter coins or an early coin can uh, visit uh, the prototype player uh, log in with your tokenly account which is the same as your ltb account and uh, you should be able to uh, to kind of try out the the player but at a fundamental level, the music industry is incredibly competitive and not at all something that I have any desire really to go after. I, I view what we've done with uh, Tokenly Music as a prototype that if it succeeds and if we can catch traction with it, we'll either become part of a larger solution, a larger system, um, or we'll become kind of a standalone company that, that focuses on building out that big, giant, artist-serving library of music and then having those partnerships with different platforms out there to connect the dots between them. The place that that I have decided, you know, three months ago, and we've been working, uh, working towards since then to focus on uh, is rewards-based crowdfunding, like I was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. um, 
so getting back to minimum viable data, think about minimum viable data for a second in the context of music. One of the things that's uh, interesting about music is that there are lots of platforms out there and they all have very similar content. So a song gets posted lots and lots and lots of different places. And so there's not too much of an advantage to connecting that ecosystem because the work that's done by those different companies and their deal making and stuff like that is most of the value of their service. But you look at something like rewards-based crowdfunding and you'll find that even though there's like between 1,000 and 1,500 platforms out there that offer this service, you never see platforms post campaigns that have been posted somewhere else, right? So if I post to Kickstarter, it means that I don't post to Indiegogo. And maybe right. I'm able to get people from Kickstarter over, to, or, you know, maybe I'm able to get people from Indiegogo over to Kickstarter using marketing, but maybe not. And so the idea of minimum viable data when attached to crowdfunding campaigns actually becomes kind of a syndication tool. And we're now effectively the user who creates a crowdfunding campaign can create it on a platform, but then that platform can offer essentially a split of the fee to different platforms out there. And platforms can see through, again, this minimum viable data, you know, how successful the campaign has been, how likely ah, it is to succeed yeah. at that point, and nice. then pull things in. And so it's kind of a win-win for everybody because the campaign gets a lot uh, more potential eyeballs that can see it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a it's a uh, profit driver for the um, for the originating campaign because they effectively are earning fees off of people who aren't actually their users, and it's positive for the referring platforms because they only pick to you know the uh, campaigns that they think are a good fit for their platform, and they uh, essentially get fees now for deals that they did not land on their platform. So you can take that same idea of minimum viable data and you can apply it to all kinds of different things. I think that this concept is going to be absolutely huge and I think it's going to happen first in music, but then it's going to get really obviously, you know, turned into a, a big deal elsewhere. So how do you do minimum viable data though in that way where you can actually, you know, like share that type of deal making? And uh, the conclusion that you come to actually is that it should be on a blockchain. And the blockchain should allow you to put pretty much everything that you want mm -hmm. on there. Uh, and there's so, a, then there's an API that, that gets that information from the blockchain. Right, exactly. Then there's an API that gets that information from the blockchain through a company like Tokenly, or you just look at the blockchain directly. That's really the advantage of using a blockchain is that you don't need to use a company like Tokenly. So one of the things that we've been doing that's actually kind of different from a lot of other projects out there is that rather than building the blockchain technologies first, we've been really focused on building the use the use cases first and effectively with so uh, so even though we're going to be enabling this deal making early on we're doing it through traditional methods we're doing it through paper contracts and relationships with lawyers and basically just connecting our different customer platforms together in order to enable this but that is kind of the longer term vision of it is that at a certain point the the, mar the model will be proven and it'll become obvious that this is the way it should be and rather than continuing to work in our own proprietary world that's what we would do is we would effectively pivot our customers so that they launch as the prime users of uh, of these uh, of this new blockchain or of the side chain or whatever technology it winds up being built on how yeah. long do you see that taking do you think that would be happening in 5 years uh, 10 years? My optimistic time frame is two to three. I really think that we'll prove this. Two to this. three years. Yeah, I think that we'll, again, I think that this stuff's going to become real obvious. Uh, it's just an issue of it's never been done before. People don't understand the value because it's just a different way of thinking about this stuff. We have different capabilities than we have in the past. You know, the potential is really enormous. And so, again, getting back to crowdfunding campaigns, the reason why we focused on crowdfunding campaigns is because it basically solves all of the problems that, that we've identified uh, with tokens at this point, allows us to not have those be problems. And it also is essentially a, um, a fire hose of, uh, of useful, valuable tokens that have been validated by people giving them money. So like as far so that, that that's really kind of the the reason to focus on crowdfunding. There are lots of different uh, industries out there where there's a huge advantage, but there are very few where each crowdfunding platform we partner with then becomes uh, essentially an engine emitting new types of tokens that are actually useful and actually valuable and actually have people vested in them already and have had some kind of vetting done on them too through most of these platforms. Right. So this is different than the traditional model of well, create an altcoin and then maybe its value will go up, right? D create an altcoin, distribute it somehow, and then maybe its value will fluctuate. Every token that gets created represents somebody who's actually backed a project in the case of crowdfunding, right? So they're already sort of validated, at least with that amount of value. 
Yeah, the uh, there's that part, but it's mostly just the company. The company is what's been validated. Ah, uh, because mm-hmm. again, like with a, a initial coin offering, perfect example of that. Uh, most of the time, again, it's just a rush to get in because people don't really understand the risk. They don't really understand the potential benefit, but they've seen that these things work to make a lot of money in other places, and so people just jump in. Whereas with rewards-based crowdfunding, it's a little bit different. You actually have to, you know, think that the project's going to be viable because otherwise, you're not going to get the thing. So, um, so that's kind of the idea there. And then the reason why crowdfunding platforms are going to partner with us is because we're effectively going to co-opt companies coming out of, out of their campaigns and allow those companies to make money for the crowdfunding platform for a much, much longer period of time than they do right now. Right now, if you crowdfund on a platform, like on Kickstarter, for example, you pay 5% as the fee to the platform, and I think it's another 3% in uh, processing. Oh, yeah, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's hard when you're raising money to give up 8%. That's about standard. Yeah, GoFundMe, Indiegogo. Okay, so my point actually is that they don't actually make that much money, relatively speaking. (laughs) The the platforms don't actually make that much money? In in crowdfunding, again, you compare crowdfunding to something like Audible, and you're talking about, you know, 5% versus 50%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 60%. Right, 60%. So, I mean, so it's all relative to what? But, But my point is, is that at the point that a crowdfunding campaign stops raising money, at the point that they're finished, then they've generated all the revenue for the crowdfunding platform that they're going to generate. And so our whole thing here is to try and onboard these people as users of token systems and of token, you know, uh, bulk discount programs and kind of of all of the things that we're talking about here. And so the way that we do that is by partnering with crowdfunding platforms. And instead of actually charging them, we don't actually charge them. Um, we actually pay them. We split revenue with them and co-brand these installations so that as essentially uh, campaigns transition out of crowdfunding, they transition into bulk discount programs and reseller programs so they can effectively start their uh, marketing right then, keep selling right then. But what about the other side of that? You know, there's a lot of crowdfunding projects that people back that never work out, right? Their product never ships or the product's way late or something like that. In this case, there's really still no protection for the backer in that case, right? They might be able to prove that they back the campaign, but so what if they never make a product, right? Right. It's just more options. Again, this doesn't fix crowdfunding the problems that it already has, which is that sometimes projects fail. Uh, It just provides more options where instead of only being stuck with it, you now have options. If you want to sell it to somebody for 20% because they're willing to take the risk and you're not, you can at least get 20% back relative to what you have right now, which is you get nothing back. So yeah, tokens don't replace anything. They just provide more options that aren't there without them. That's an improvement <laughs> to have the ability to liquidate your your backingness for a campaign, right? <laughs> the other advantage of using tokens, again, so the whole the whole thing here is about providing this underlying layer that connects together people who are in the same industry but that operate their own, you know, kind of closed uh, closed off spaces and their own proprietary spaces. Because ultimately, you know, crowdfunding this is this is especially true in lending crowdfunding. There's very little liquidity in it. Uh, so there's not a lot of money that kind of flows around. So like uh, Bank to the Future, for example, they told us, you know, we shouldn't try to raise more than this amount of money because their platform can't support it. And that's a perfect example of the type of uh, low liquidity that exists in this place. If the project is good enough to get funded one place, chances are pretty good the project would get funders from other places, but they don't know about it and the platforms don't have any incentive because there's not a, a reason and be a way to make them available for it without just sending, you know, people off to a competitor. So it's about taking people who are effectively colleagues within the space and these different platforms and allowing them to work together in a way that's beneficial for everybody in the entire ecosystem. Right. Okay. So you're doing your crowd sale for Tokenly on Bank to the Future. What is Bank to the Future and why are you doing it that way? And this is everything that we just talked about. This is not going to apply to your crowd sale to raise funds for Tokenly. This model is not in effect yet for your crowd sale. <laughs> but tell me, tell me about your crowd sale. What is Bank to the Future and how are you going to do it? So yeah, so if somebody wants to uh, support Tokenly as, you know, like in a crowd sale capacity uh, without getting into the equity or ownership or any of that nonsense, which is complicated, then you can just buy Tokenly tokens. They're not going to appreciate in value. They're $5 gift certificates. So again, like we've tried to really steer clear of anything that looks like equity when it isn't actually equity. And that's the reason to use a platform like Bank to the Future is that that's what they do. They focus on the compliance side. They focus on making sure that everything, you know, all the ducks are in a row. And also it lets us sell equity 
um, in the company without having you know a whole bunch of different shareholders on our books. It means that because what happens is that when you invest through Bank to the Future, uh, if the campaign happens successfully, then Bank to the Future forms a new company that is specifically represented for that investment that they've made into whatever the funded company is. And then all the people on the platform get ownership of that company. So we only have the holding company on our books um, and they handle all of the shareholder relations and stuff like that for people on their platform. Okay. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're doing an equity crowd sale because, um, you know, because I feel like that's the only rational way to do this. Uh, this is risky. <laughs> uh, we don't want to issue a token. You know, this allows us to engage with people who are willing to take that risk and who can see the vision of what we're doing and, you know, want to be part of it. So you are not doing like, for example, what Ethereum did. They were selling the thing that lets people use their software eventually, but it could appreciate and fluctuate in value or it could have gone to zero or whatever. You're selling something, pre-selling something that has a fixed value, right? Well, we're not even pre-selling it. You can use Tokenly now. It's been a working token in our ecosystem for the last year. So you're just selling something that lets you use the Tokenly ecosystem, but for a fixed value. Right. I mean, like I said, it's basically a gift certificate that you can get discounts for if you buy in bulk. But the people who want to do that right now, again, there's a bit of a chicken egg problem here. So the reason why we're selling equity is because exactly that. It's very straightforward. People understand you know, how this works. They don't have to quantify it in some weird or crazy way, and they can get into it with some kind of idea of what they could potentially get out of it. It also, again, limits the types of people who can invest with us to people who fall under accredited investor status uh, in their various countries. And you're right, we didn't have to do that. But there is something to be said about the amount of risk that comes along with this type of venture, right? We've built all the precursors, we've done all the work, we've done a ton of research, and made a lot of contacts, but the reality is, is we don't yet have our first actual customer, and we can't get our first actual customer until we've put together kind of this command and control center um, for all of our various tools that takes all of these kind of distributed things and puts them into one solid package that's very easy to use and focused on the particular use case. So again, it's about, we've got all the puzzle pieces, but now they need to go together. And at the point that they go together, then it's just about onboarding platforms. And every time we onboard a crowdfunding platform, effectively, it becomes, again, an engine that on a monthly basis will be able to emit a predictable number of new types of tokens because they have, you know, a certain number of campaigns that will on average succeed per month. So important to note also, like I said, um, tokens, you know, new technology, new technology. And so a lot of the things that, um, that will eventually be very, very simple and very, very easy are not really that simple and easy yet. So for this first set of integrations, we're actually not even requiring that users take possession of their reward in token form. There will be an option where they'll be able to say, I would like to take this as a token so I can use it for the things that it gives me as a token. And if not, then they can just take it as a promise and then still get the advantage of essentially the access features, um, but, uh, but not have to worry about dealing with wallets and stuff like that. So we think that it's going to be a progression where it'll, you know, we just have to get the initial integrations. And then once you've got the integrations and there are more uh, platforms that are participating in this essentially crowdfund connect network, um, then it makes a lot more sense to move over to tokens because then it means that it doesn't matter what platform you're using. It just matters that you have the right token. And then all platforms can essentially, uh, a campaign can push things out through the API and it goes to people on all the different platforms just based on what tokens they have, as opposed to needing to go to the originating one or anything like that. Tokenly as a company and as a solution is the product of three years worth of blue sky thinking and two years of grinding development. While I've provided much of the big picture thinking, I'm not a developer and never would have gotten to this point without my two exceptionally talented technical co-founders, Devin Weller and Nick Rathman. Guys, thanks for joining me today. So recently we've been talking about Ethereum and, uh, and tokens built on Bitcoin. And I was hoping that you could talk to us because people talk a lot about Ethereum like it's this, uh, you know, really interesting opportunity that's available right now. And we've been interested in integrating it, but it seems like it's still kind of early phase. So can you talk to us about the differences between tokens built on Ethereum versus tokens built on Bitcoin using the counterparty protocol? Sure. Counterparties tokens are global to the whole counterparty ecosystem. So a token that I create, you know, Devon token on Counterparty will immediately show up in your wallet if you've got a, a wallet that that doesn't know anything about Devon token yet. 
Ethereum, on the other hand, at, at their current stage, requires everybody to intentionally make themselves aware of a token. In, in other words, if I create a token in my wallet uh, called Devon Token on Ethereum, and I say, hey, Adam, I'm going to send you some Devon Token, you're not going to know about that token unless you explicitly go into your wallet and say, hey, wallet, pay attention to this specific contract that has to do with Devon Token. I don't feel like it's really ready yet for mass uh, adoption. They just haven't gotten there. I think they're moving that way. Um, I think tokens are an integral part of Ethereum, but it's just not ready yet. A lot of the services that Tokenly provides are kind of designed to help these. Um, I like to I like to think of tokens built on counterparty kind of as ball bearings, um, in that they you know you can have you can paint it a different color, right? You you can uh, do different things to it. You can put it into a machine that uses it in a specific way. But fundamentally, they're all the same type of thing. And with Ethereum, it seems like that's really not the case. It seems like you can have a token that performs in this fashion and has you know this set of rules and fundamentals and just like almost like physics built around it. But something else, because they're really just smart contracts, uh, it can it can be it can have an entirely different set of kind of basic assumptions built around it. Right. Yeah, and that's Ethereum's strength and its weakness when it comes to to tokens. They're super powerful in Ethereum. I mean, it's it's a computing platform. It's not just an asset exchange platform. So they conflate this idea of token assets with things that tokens can do, and that all gets merged into a, a smart contract. So you're, you're right. It's definitely more powerful, but with greater power comes <laughs> more responsibility. You have, to, you have to be in charge of using that power in a way that makes sense to, to consumer. You're responsible for doing that rather than the platform taking care of that global awareness of tokens. So at this point with Ethereum, what we're really considering doing is not integrating the token side of it, where, you know, if we wanted to create LTB coin on the Ethereum platform, that's not really something that's interesting to us. But it is interesting to allow people to purchase uh, tokens built on counterparty through vending machines with Ether. So you might pay with Ether and then you get back your token that is actually on the counterparty network using the Bitcoin blockchain. So we've been talking about um, about how to do this. Can can you kind of just go over that real quick? We have a core software component called XChain that watches the blockchain, watches the Bitcoin blockchain right now for counterparty transactions, and we're going to build a, a module that also will, you know, watch Ethereum uh, transactions in the same way, and just look for incoming Ether payments, and then um, notify the swap bot, and that swap bot will then send out the corresponding token based on the rules of the swap bot. Thanks, Devin. I'm really looking forward to our first cross-chain compatibility, and I wish you luck with the implementation. So, Nick, you've been building tools using the Bitcoin network for more than two years now. Can you talk about how both the network and your approach to building those tools has changed in that time? Uh, yeah, it's been a pretty interesting experience uh, working with Bitcoin the past few years. A couple of years ago, we started LTB Coin, and uh, one of the first uh, problems that we had to figure out was how to actually send LGB coin to lots of people without having to do it all by hand. In counterparty, you can't uh, just do like a multi-send like you can with normal Bitcoin because it would just uh, take too much data. And so with counterparty, you actually have to make uh, individual sends for every transaction. And so what we came up with was a system that basically generates a Bitcoin address, you send uh, the funds to it, and then it automatically over time distributes uh, each token to each user, which currently is around a thousand users. And uh, yeah, one of the main issues that we came into was actually a transaction malleability. So before we were um, making the transactions, so we chained them off of each other. Each transaction would be unconfirmed, and then the next transaction would use the previous unconfirmed transaction to build the next transaction, and so on. And then with transaction malleability, basically any one of those transactions could have their ID randomly changed which actually breaks the entire chain of transactions. So what we had to do was um, do something which I call an address priming or input priming. And basically, you create a transaction to yourself with however many inputs that you want to send. And then each of those inputs carries enough Bitcoin to have enough fee to pay for the next transaction. So once all those inputs are complete, you can send however many transactions you need to and not worry about the malleability at all. So one of the first tools that you created was was exactly that, was the uh, shared distributor is what we called it at the time, or the asset distributor. And then malleability made you kind of rewrite it about six months ago. For the last couple of months, for the last, I guess, month now, 
you've been working on creating a new version of the distributor that instead of being a kind of a module that's built into the Let's Talk Bitcoin platform, instead it's, it's a standalone thing. And one of the things that's going to be different about it is that it's going to have an API so that users won't actually need to visit the service itself in order to use it to do distributions for whatever their project is. Nearly everything we do seems to have an API associated with it. Um, can you talk to us about the strategy for what we're doing with APIs, what the point of it is? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, the overall vision is just to automate everything, basically. So in my point of view, everything that you can do with the swap bots, with the accounts, with the bit split, everything should all be able to create an automated program that can just do it all for you and create all kinds of interesting applications that uh, combine the different services together to uh, accomplish whatever it is for a game or rewards program or whatever else. Thanks, Nick. And just a heads up that on next week's episode, I'll be announcing the details of a Tokenly API integration contest, where the most interesting entry will win a Bitcoin prize. We're really looking forward to seeing how creative developers connect the dots we've spent the last couple of years creating. More details soon. For this final segment, we'll rejoin the conversation with Stephanie as I spill the beans on what I think is the most important accomplishment we've made so far, solving two of the biggest problems faced by any consumer-oriented cryptocurrency project in one swoop. The two problems that I think are most important that we've solved that we haven't talked about yet <laughs> is the fact that you can't buy tokens with dollars and the, the instant gratification problem too. And the instant gratification problem is like taking the music example. If I buy an album, right, a digital album that grants me streaming rights, I don't want to wait an hour and a half before yeah. I can use those streaming rights. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to do that right now. Which you, which you might be doing if you were waiting for a token to move on an, on something like Counterparty, right? Because it can be slow. It's definitely slow. Best case scenario, you're looking at a couple of minutes. Yeah. And, in, and it can be uh, quite a bit uh, longer than that, depending on the network. And the network recently has been really, really kind of unpredictable. And uh, fees, again, like in theory, you would think that the more fee you pay, the higher your, your priority is and the faster you'll get into a block. But in practice, it doesn't always work like that. There are other factors in play, too. Both of these problems are solved by one thing, which is not giving the person the token until the payment is cleared. And so if you're talking about Bitcoin, that's like 30 minutes to 60 minutes to maybe an hour and a half, depending on, you know, depending. Uh, but if you're talking about dollars, that's like two months. So Tokenly provides an API that provides token controlled access, right? So a website like Kickstarter would integrate our API. And then uh, ask questions, uh, you know, what does this user have? Um, or does this user have X amount of tokens? So you can either ask yes, no, or they can just ask for kind of the what's in their public uh, holdings. So Tokenly as a company can allow people to give two types of access. We right now only provide token access. So you have access if you have the token confirmed in your wallet. You don't have access if you don't. But with something like music, again, you could buy it with dollars gain database access, right? So just like normal, uh, old fashioned access. And then once the payment is cleared, the token is delivered and the access switches from being non-transferable, but instant and based on database access to transferable, but not instant and based on possession of the token or not. Using that kind of mechanism, we can basically do both things. We can allow people to pay in dollars because what we're selling is not the token. What we're selling is the access. And then at the point that the payment clears, then we reduce the amount of risk that's, uh, that's being bared by the company um, by delivering that to the, the user in a decentralized fashion so that if we get you know, violated and our database gets hacked or whatever, that it's not a problem. So we can do that for Bitcoin and you know, it might take an hour and a half or you would just you'd get the instant access and then you know, an hour and a half later, you've got the token access. But with dollars, it might be two months and there's really no difference. The only difference is that you can't spend it. So again, crowdfunding is a perfect example of a place where this is a good fit because very, very rarely uh, does a crowdfunding campaign fund and then deliver something that's actually going to be a deliverable inside of two months. Usually you're looking at between three and six and some are a lot longer than that. So it means that you know it's not transferable for that point unless you pay with Bitcoin or something like that. But 
you can buy it, you can get the benefit of the token, and you can eventually get the token with never having gone into Bitcoin at all. Right. So, That's cool. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, so all of these are, are components. And the place that all of this leads you is that tokens are getting a lot easier to use. Uh, the stuff that we're providing is this base level of functionality. You mentioned uh, Ethereum a little bit earlier and how we're not doing uh, we're, we're not doing like a token sale in that fashion. Right. And the reason why we're not is because we're not Ethereum. Um, and we're not <laughs> counterparty and we're not anything else like that. We don't build blockchains. We don't even build tokens. We build tools that allow other people and allow specific use cases to essentially connect the dots instead of having to draw the whole picture and you know, do whatever it is that you want to do with that particular thing whenever the heck you want to do it. So one of the things that people uh, often mistake about Tokenly is that we are a counterparty company. And this is actually not true. Um, we currently use counterparty tokens for everything, but the way that our system is designed is um, based around a core component that is basically watches the blockchain and then our different services subscribe to it and then it sends notifications. So SwapBot, for example, isn't actually watching the blockchain. It's talking to another of our components called XChain that then talks to SwapBot and uh, looks at the blockchain on its behalf and is able to do that. And so it's able to keep things really fast. And that's really what that component is about. It's about being able to retrieve information from the blockchain in a really, really fast manner. Um, so we're about to start integrating Ethereum. And uh, we've been looking at it for a couple of weeks. And Ethereum tokens are really, really, really different than Counterparty. Um, they're much more powerful, but they're also way weirder. And there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with them. So we're not really looking at integrating Counterparty, or sorry, we're not really looking at integrating Ethereum tokens um, yet. Uh, we are looking at integrating the Ethereum token. So you would be able to buy something um, from a, a swap bot vending machine using Ether, and then you'd be able to get a counterparty-based token delivered to your counterparty-compatible address. And so one of the questions that comes up a lot is, uh, how do we do that without being money transmitters? And money transmission, again, I am not a lawyer. This is just based on my conversations. Um, money transmission has two components, essentially. It's value stored in time or value um, transferred between two different people. Uh, we have never allowed people to use our vending machine system to buy something for someone else. When you place an order, you, you know, put in your payment, you get the, uh, the thing that you're buying sent right back to the same address. And it is exactly to do that. It's so that we are not a money transmitter by either definition. Uh, we only send it back to the person put it in. So again, it's very much like a vending machine. Uh, rather than allowing you, like Shapeshift does, to put in your address and then send it back, we're going to ask you to one time add that address to your Tokenly account. Essentially prove to the Tokenly service that you own it, that it's yours. And now when you place a, an order using that, it will recognize your account based on the address that sends the payment. And then it'll figure out, you know, if it's a counterparty address, then it'll send it to your counterparty address that you've designated. If it's an Ethereum address, it'll send it to your Ethereum address that you've designated. So it allows us to retain that really simple kind of bridging function between these two different cryptocurrencies, two blockchains that don't by their nature talk to each other, can be made to talk to each other through our service. Um, and in doing so, it makes it so that it doesn't really matter what type of uh, blockchain you are on. It just matters if it's compatible with the bridging service, which is Tokenly. And then if it is, then you can you know, do whatever you want using whatever token you want. And eventually our wallets will support kind of everything that we engage with. But yeah, that's kind of really where we sit. It's not that we're building blockchains because we're not. It's not that we're building tokens because we're not. It's that we act as an enabling bridge layer, both to connect blockchains to other blockchains, to connect companies to other companies, and to frankly enable users uh, of any kind who have something valuable that should be represented as a token to actually do that. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin. Content for today's show was provided by Stephanie, Nick, Devin, and Adam. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens and mindtomatter.org. This episode was edited by Adam B. Levine. The magic word for today's episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin is go. That's G-O. Go. You've got until the 16th of April to visit letstalkbitcoin.com or the Let's Talk Bitcoin iOS app to enter it for your share of the listener rewards. Any questions or comments? Email Adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Have a good one.